Hi, we're going to uh, get started with chapter four of Night. We're going to read uh, about half the chapter. Uh, so when I'm done reading, I will talk about it a little bit. Um, so keep in mind a couple things. Number one, part of the process here is for you to also be reading along. Improve your reading fluency. Listen to the words that I'm saying. Listen to the emotion. Listen to the rise and fall of my voice. All of those are tools that we use to not just read the words, but to understand the ideas. Because if we read everything just like this, like a monotone robot voice, then we don't really hear any of the emotion or understanding. And there's a lot of things that are really important to understanding aside than just the words. So, all right, here we go. The camp looked as though it had been through an epidemic, empty and dead. Only a few well-dressed inmates were wandering between the blocks. Of course, we first had to pass through the showers. The head of the camp joined us there. He was a stocky man with big shoulders, the neck of a bull, thick lips and curly hair. He gave an impression of kindness. From time to time, a smile would linger in his gray-blue eyes. Our convoy included a few 10, 12-year-olds. The officer took an interest in them and gave orders to bring them food. We were given new clothing and settled in two tents. We were to wait there until we could be incorporated into work commandos. Then we would be assigned to a block. In the evening, the commandos returned from the work yards. Roll call. We began looking for people we knew, asking the veterans which work commandos were the best and which one which block one should try to enter. All the inmates agreed. Buna is a very good camp. One can hold one's own here. The most important thing is not to be assigned to the construction commando, as if we had a choice. Our tent leader was a German, an assassin's face, fleshy lips, hands resembling a wolf's paws. The camp's food had agreed with him. He could hardly move, he was so fat. Like the head of the camp, he liked children. Immediately after our arrival, he had bread brought for them, some soup and margarine. In fact, this affection was not entirely altruistic. There existed here a veritable traffic of children among homosexuals, I learned later. He told us, You will stay with me for three days in quarantine. Afterward, you will go to work. Tomorrow, medical checkup. One of his aides... A tough-looking boy with shifty eyes came over to me. Would you like to get into a good commando? Of course, but on one condition. I want to stay with my father. All right, he said. I can arrange it. For a pittance. Your shoes. I'll give you another pair. I refused him my shoes. They were all I had left. I'll also give you a ration of bread with some margarine. You like my shoes. I would not let him have them. Later, they were taken from me anyway, in exchange for nothing that time. The medical checkup took place outside, early in the morning, before three doctors seated on a bench. The first one hardly examined me. He just asked, are you in good health? Who would have dared to admit the opposite? On the other hand, the dentist seemed more conscientious. He asked me to open my mouth wide. In fact, he was not looking for decay, but for gold teeth. Those who had gold in their mouths were listed by their number. I did have a gold crown. The first three days went by quickly. On the fourth day, as we stood in front of our tent, the capos appeared. Each one began to choose the men he liked. You, you, and you, they pointed fingers, the way one might choose cattle or merchandise. We followed our capo, a young man. He made us halt at the door of the first block, near the entrance to the camp. This was the orchestra's block. He motioned us inside. We were surprised. What had we to do with music? The orchestra was playing a military march, always the same. Dozens of commandos were marching off in step to the workyards. The capos were beating the time. Left, right, left, right. SS officers, pen in hand, recorded the number of men leaving. The orchestra continued to play the same march until the last commando had passed. Then the conductor's baton stopped moving, and the orchestra fell silent. The cable yelled, Fall in! We fell into ranks of five, with the musicians. We left the camp without music, but in step. We still had the march in our ears. 
left, right, left, right. We struck up conversations with our neighbors, the musicians. Almost all of them were Jews. Julique, the Pole, with eyeglasses and a cynical smile and a pale face. Luis, a native of Holland, a well-known violinist. He complained that they would not let him play Beethoven. Jews were not allowed to play German music. Hans, the young man from Berlin, was full of wit. The foreman was a Pole. Franek, a former student in Warsaw. Julique explained to me, we work in a warehouse of electrical materials, not far from here. The work is neither difficult nor dangerous. Only Eidek, the capo, occasionally has fits of madness. And then you better stay out of his way. You are lucky, little fellow, said Hans, smiling. You fell into a good commando. Ten minutes later, we stood in front of the warehouse. A German employee, a civilian, the Meister, came to meet us. He paid as much attention to us as would a shopkeeper receiving a delivery of old rags. Our comrades were right. The work was not difficult. Sitting on the ground, we counted bolts, bulbs, and various small electrical parts. The capo launched into a lengthy explanation of the importance of this work, warning us that anyone who proved to be lazy would be held accountable. My new comrades reassured me, don't worry, he has to say this because of the Meister. There were many Polish civilians here, and a few French, <coughs> excuse me, and a few French women as well. The women silently greeted the musicians with their eyes. Franek, the foreman, assigned me to a corner. Don't kill yourself. There's no hurry. But watch out. Don't let an SS catch you. Please, sir, I'd like to be near my father. All right, your father will work here, next to you. We were lucky. Two boys came to join our group, Yossi and Tibi, two brothers from Czechoslovakia, whose parents had been exterminated in Birkenau. They lived for each other, body and soul. They quickly became my friends. Having once belonged to a Zionist youth organization, they knew countless Hebrew songs. And so we would sometimes hum melodies, evoking the gentle waters of the Jordan River and the majestic sanctity of Jerusalem. We also spoke often about Palestine. Their parents, like mine, had not had the courage to sell everything and emigrate while there was still time. We decided that if we were allowed to live until liberation, we would not stay another day in Europe. We would board the first trip to Haifa. First ship to Haifa. Still lost in his Kabbalistic dreams, a Kiba drummer had discovered a verse from the Bible which, translated into numbers, made it possible for him to predict redemption in the weeks to come. We had left the tents for the musician's block. We now were entitled to a blanket, a washbowl, and a bar of soap. The Blakaste was a German Jew. It was good to have a Jew as your leader. His name was Alphonse, a young man with a startlingly wizened face. He was totally devoted to defending his block. Whenever he could, he would organize a cauldron of soup for the young, for the weak, for all those who dreamed more of an extra portion of food than of liberty. One day, when we had just returned from the warehouse, I was summoned by the block secretary. Hey, 7713. It's me. After your meal, you're to go to see the dentist. But I don't have a toothache. After your meal, without fail. I went to the infirmary block. Some 20 prisoners were waiting in line at the entrance. It didn't take long to learn the reason for, the, for our summons. Our gold teeth were to be extracted. The dentist, a Jew from Czechoslovakia, had a face not unlike a death mask. When he opened his mouth, he had a ghastly vision of yellow, rotten teeth. Seated in his chair, I asked meekly, What are you going to do, sir? I shall remove your gold crown. That's all, he said, clearly indifferent. I thought of pretending to be sick. Couldn't you wait a few days, sir? <laughs> I don't feel well. Uh, I have a fever. He wrinkled his brow, thought for a moment, took my pulse. All right, son, but you come back to see me when you feel better. But don't wait for me to call you. I went back to see him a week later with the same excuse. I still was not feeling better. 
he did not seem surprised, and I don't know whether he believed me. Yet he most likely was pleased that I had come back on my own, as I had promised. He granted me a further delay. A few days after my visit, the dentist's office was shut down. He had been thrown into prison and was about to be hanged. It appeared that he had been dealing in the prisoner's gold teeth for his own benefit. I felt no pity for him. In fact, I was pleased with what was happening to him. My gold crown was safe. It could be useful to me one day to buy something, some bread or even time to live. At that moment in time, all that mattered to me was my daily bowl of soup, my crust of stale bread, the bread, the soup, those were my entire life. I was nothing but a body, perhaps even less, a famished stomach. The stomach alone was measuring time. In the warehouse, I often worked next to a young French woman. We did not speak. She did not know German, and I did not understand French. I thought she looked Jewish, Jewish, though she passed for Aryan. She was a forced labor inmate. One day, when Idik was venting his fury, I happened to cross his path. He threw himself on me like a wild beast, beating me in the chest, on the head, throwing me to the ground and picking me up again, crushing me with ever more violent blows until I was covered in blood. As I bit my lips in order not to howl with pain, he must have mistaken my silence for defiance. And so he continued to hit me harder and harder. Abruptly, he calmed down and sent me back to work as if nothing had happened. As if we had taken part in a game in which both rules, both roles were of equal importance. I dragged myself to my corner. I was aching all over. I felt a cool hand wiping the blood from my forehead. It was the French girl. She was smiling her mournful smile as she slipped me a crust of bread. She looked straight into my eyes. I knew she wanted to talk to me, but that she was paralyzed with fear. She remained like that for some time, and then her face lit up, and she said, in almost perfect German, Bite your lip, little brother. Don't cry. Keep your anger, your hate, for another day, for later. The day will come, but not now. Wait. Clutch your teeth and wait. Many years later, in Paris, I sat in the metro reading my newspaper. Across the aisle, a beautiful woman with dark hair and dreamy eyes. I had seen those eyes before. Madame, don't you recognize me? I don't know you, sir. In 1944, you were in Poland, in Buna, weren't you? Yes, but you worked in a depot, a warehouse for electrical parts. Yes, she said, looking troubled. And then after a moment of silence, wait, I remember. Idek the capo, uh, the young Jewish boy, your sweet words. We left the metro together and sat down at a cafe terrace. We spent the whole evening reminiscing. Before parting, I said, may I ask one more question? I know what it is. Am I Jewish? Yes, I am, from an observant family. During the occupation, I had false papers and passed as Aryan. And that was how I was assigned to a forced labor unit. When they deported me to Germany, I eluded being sent to a concentration camp. At the depot, nobody knew that I spoke German. It would have aroused suspicion. I was, it was imprudent of me to say those few words to you. But I knew that you would not betray me. Another time, we were loading diesel motors onto freight cars under the supervision of some German soldiers. Eidek was on edge. He had trouble restraining himself. Suddenly, he exploded. The victim this time was my father. You old loafer, he started yelling. Is this what you call working? And he began beating him with an iron bar. At first, my father simply doubled over under the blows. But then he seemed to break in break in two like an old tree struck by lightning. I had watched it all happening without moving. I kept silent. In fact, I thought of stealing away in order not to suffer the blows. 
what's more, if I felt anger at that moment, it was not directed at the capo, but at my father. Why couldn't he have avoided Eidek's wrath? That was what life in a concentration camp had made of me. Frenick, the foreman, one day noticed the gold crown in my mouth. Let me have your crown, kid. I answered them. I answered that I could not, because without that crown, I could no longer eat. For what they give you to eat, kid? I found another answer. My crown had been listed in the register during the medical checkup. This could mean trouble for us both. If you don't give me your crown, it'll cost you much more. All of a sudden, this pleasant and intelligent young man had changed. His eyes were shining with greed. I told him that I needed to get my father's advice. Go ahead, go ahead, kid. Ask. But I want the answer by tomorrow. When I mentioned it to my father, he hesitated. After a long silence, he said, No, oh, my son, we cannot do this. He will seek revenge. He won't dare, my son. Unfortunately, Franick knew how to handle this. He knew my weak spot. My father had never served in the military and could not march and step. But here, whenever we moved from one place to another, it was in step. That presented Frannick with the opportunity to torment him, and on a daily basis to thrash him savagely. Left, right, punched him. Left, right, he slapped him. I decided to give my father lessons in marching in step and keeping time. We began practicing in front of our block. I would command, left, right, my father would try. The inmates made fun of us. Look at the little officer teaching the old man to march. Hey, little general, how many rations of bread does the old man give you for this? <laughs> but my father did not make sufficient progress, and the blows continued to rain on him. So, you still don't know how to march and step, you old good-for-nothing? This went on for two weeks. It was untenable. We had to give in that day. Franick burst into savage laughter. <laughs> I knew it. I knew that I would win, kid. <laughs> Better late than never. And because you made me wait, it will also cost you a ration of bread. A ration of bread for one of my pals, a famous dentist from Warsaw, to pay him for pulling out your crown. What? My ration of bread so that you can have my crown? Frannick smiled. What would you like? That I break your teeth by smashing your face? That evening, in the latrines, the dentist from Warsaw pulled my crown with the help of a rusty spoon. Frannick became pleasant again. From time to time, he even gave me extra soup. But it didn't last long. Two weeks later, all the poles were transferred to another camp. I lost my crown for nothing. All right, we will pause there. Let's talk quickly about what we've read. So, uh, another sad, disgusting state of humanity. Uh, the chapter begins by telling us how some of the, 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 the men in power were particularly kind to the young boys, but it turns out there was just a sexual perversion that they would traffic these children in for uh, sexual gratification, which is horrific and terrible. Uh, and sad. All right. Um, I wanted to stay with my father. Once again, we see this, this father-son relationship where uh, Ellie is doing what he can to stay by his father's side. We also see him looking for his father's um, opinion on things. So Ellie still depends and relies on his father. They have a close relationship. Be spectacled is just a fancy way to say he was wearing glasses because glasses and spectacles are the same. So yeah. Add this prefix be spectacled, which means to have it on like bedazzled or bejeweled. For those of you that might be bedazzlers. All right. Um, he would organize a cauldron of soup for all those who are dreaming more about an extra plateful than of liberty. You guys, here's what this means it means that these people in these camps were much more concerned about what they were going to eat next than if they would ever be freed. Freedom kind of didn't even matter because if I don't eat today, I'm going to die by tomorrow. So food became much more important than their freedom, which is just sad. It's just heartbreaking. 
Okay, uh, here are some more pictures with um, some of these, these people who got the tattoos on their arm. Elie Wiesel specifically, as he noted in his book, is A7713. All right. Uh, he was given a reprieve. It's to cancel or postpone the punishment. The dentist showed a little bit of mercy to Eli. To Eli. Um, excuse me. Ellie. Eli is my son. Get the name here. Ellie, by sh allowing him to keep his tooth for a little while longer. So he was given just a little bit of extra time. A few days after this visit of mine, they closed the dentist's surgery. and He was thrown into prison. He was going to be hanged. So here's what I find most interesting. I did not feel any pity for him. So you could add this to your double entry journal. I think it's a good passage. What do you think about it? Here's what I think. I think he says, I did not feel any pity for him because frankly, that dentist was a dirty, rotten dude. He was pulling out teeth and selling the gold on the side. He wasn't being forced to do this every time by the Nazis. He kind of did it for his own benefit. And if you are pulling out my teeth for your own benefit, not just to save your life, but to be able to like make a profit off of me, you suck, dude. So Ellie says, I didn't feel any pity when he got hanged. But it's also heartbreaking because it's this breaking down of like social consideration. I mean, the man's going to hang. He's going to die. And Ellie's like, I don't even care. So it's just complicated. I had this complicated thought process to go through. It's all heartbreaking. So anyway, on one hand, I totally get it. On the other hand, man's going to die. All right. Uh, what I like here is this interlude that Ellie gives us. So we got the beginning of the book. This is the timeline of the book. We got all these events in the concentration camp. And Ellie is sent to this, uh, this workhouse where they're sorting the nuts and the bolts. And he jumps way ahead of time. And one of the phrases here is many years later. So he's saying, look, I'm going to fast forward like way past right now. So beyond the end of the book, beyond the end of the war, beyond my liberation, all the way out here, after the war ended and Ellie was able to live freely and he's just sitting on the bus, on the metro, and he happens to recognize this woman from way back here who helped him when he was beat up. That's pretty amazing that, number one, he would see her and bump into her, and number two, uh, that they both survived and so I love that little interlude. I love that part of the story. But let's keep in mind that the, the timeline, so don't get too confused. All right. Father-son relationship. In fact, I was thinking of how to get farther away so that I would not be hit myself. I was angry with him. My father. I was angry with my father. I didn't want to get hit, and I'm angry at you for getting hit. So we see this relationship kind of becoming complicated where Ellie is becoming much more like it's just all about me right now. And I don't care that my dad's getting beat. I don't want to get beat either. Now I'm angry at you for making anyone get beat because now we're all at risk. But also that the man beating Ellie's father knew that that hurt Ellie. And so that's what was going to get him to give the gold tooth. He knew my weak point. So I'm, I'm mad at my father here, but my father is also where my heart is. Okay. So that finishes that up. All right. Awesome. Talk to you guys later. Bye now.